said, grab, ork, said, grab, ork, said, grab, ork. Don't worry, that's just a, an old Unix ritual to appease the demo gods. They like the sacrifice of Pike Place roast. Welcome to captaining a container ship, Docker orchestration with container. Docker orchestration, what's that for? Well, orchestration is basically running Docker containers at scale. If you are um, only running single containers, that's still quite easy. You can do everything by hand. Docker gives you a lot of tools that you can use to download images, spin up containers, check if they're running, and shut them down again. Who of you is already at that state, running a handful of containers, spinning up one from time to time for development or testing or things like that? Well, the probability is high that you like Docker because it's really easy to, to get into and to get started. And when the number of containers grows, things are getting much more complex. So if you're really more at that stage, you can't do any manual stuff anymore. And uh, you need to have solutions that will help you maintain all these containers, all their relationships and stuff. And if you don't learn to use these tools, these orchestration tools, you might end up like this. So, who is at that stage? All right, let's prepare you for it. Why orchestration? As soon as you've started using Docker in earnest, um, there will be more than one container. Because if you are following the Docker philosophy of one single application per container, you'll end up with groups of containers and uh, these containers all have to be managed. You need to spin them up, you need to shut them down. They need to be distributed if you like to, for example, use different resources for different applications. So let's pick an example. Um, running a web server like Apache will require much different resources from your infrastructure than, for example, running a MySQL container. You might want to run MySQL on, on a host that uses SSD-based storage. You might want to uh, run a memcached container on a machine that ha has lots of RAM. And so you have to select the right infrastructure for the right container. They need to be scheduled, which means they need to be spun up, and if they go down by accident or uh, because you want them to, you probably want to start them again sometime. They need to be load balanced, especially if you are using the distributed nature of these things. You'd like to be able to distribute load between multiple Drupal containers, for example. And that gets quite complex as soon as the number of containers grows. Then there's all these dependencies between containers. If your Drupal container, for example, needs to talk to the database or needs to talk to memcached, there needs to be some way of these containers knowing of each other. They need to be linked or um, connected by 
other means. If you have outages and uh, say one of your container hosts goes down and you spin up another host with a new memcached instance, for example, your Drupal container needs to discover that the old memcached instance has gone away and that there's a new one to replace it. Another thing that gets quite interesting quickly is sharing secrets between these containers. For example, if you are creating a Drupal database, the database server that creates it needs to use the same user account and password as your Drupal container that wants to connect to this database. How do you make sure that, for example, if you change the database password and spin up a new database, that your Drupal containers will automatically use the new password. If you are doing this by hand, you'll get uh, into a situation quickly uh, where things don't work anymore because you forgot to update uh, a certain setting here or forgot to um, uh, replicate a configuration file to another location, things like that. And that's where orchestration will take a lot of work off you. A simple incarnation of this is included in the standard Docker um, application suite. It's called Docker Compose, and it lets you spin up multiple containers on a single host, normally your workstation, um, and uh, takes care of all these things like links and uh, declaring shared secrets is easy because you only have one single file where you declare all these things since everything is limited to a single machine. As soon as you start spreading out, especially if you want to run a production infrastructure, um, you'll need something like container. Container is, as the company behind the application, also co called Container, says, is an open source container platform built to maximize developer happiness. Works on any cloud, easy to set up, simple to use. And that's why I immediately started to like container when I started uh, using it and, and dabbling with it because um, they keep their promise. It's easy to set up, it's simple to use, and it still um, can do a lot of stuff. So why choose container over other alternatives? <coughs> container is simple. Uh, in this uh, talk, I'll show you how to spin up single containers and a whole stack with a load balanced Drupal installation. And uh, if you use the demo script that I've made available, I'll, I'll show the, you the link later, um, you could do uh, from zero to running Drupal infrastructure in five minutes. It's inexpensive since it's open source software. It's full featured in the sense that it has everything for you to go to the next level. If you are still using the Docker command like Docker run and stuff, or even Docker compose, um, it'll be just uh, an easy step to, to get into a container and start using a multi-host infrastructure for your containers. It's production ready. Um, people are using it in production and uh, it uh, can handle production load. It's secure, it uh, supports a lot of stuff that you need to run secure web applications and it's flexible um, because it uh, is very adaptive. You can install it in less than one hour. Everything comes bundled, of course, in the form of containers again and uh, it simply builds on the YAML syntax that Docker Compose uses, and it simply extends it 
to be able to run on multiple hosts. There are alternatives, of course, and um, you probably know a few of them. Uh, the most prominent is Kubernetes, um, or there's also things like Mesos. But when I started looking into these things um, last year, um, it felt like uh, using these alternatives is like if, you're, if you want to start baking cupcakes, um, the recipe would start with, first, let's build an industrial oven. <laughs> and container isn't like that. Another thing that makes container inexpensive is that you can even use Let's Encrypt out of the box, so you don't, have, so you don't even have to spend money on SSL certificates. It comes with all the building blocks you need. It has its own private image registry, so you don't have to put your Docker images into the public Docker hub. It comes with a load balancer that's amazingly easy to use. It supports service discovery. It has its own secrets storage where um, passwords and things like that or SSL certificates can be stored securely. And of course, um, there's an unwritten law in IT that all secrets storage have to be named Vault because that makes Googling easy. Um, and it has its own key value store, so if you need to um, store information about your infrastructure, about your application stack in a central place, it has that as well. Container has well-thought-out user authentication. It uses OAuth um, for user authentication so that the people that use Container can authenticate against a central user registry. It supports health checks that are both used in load balancing so that traffic doesn't go to a container that has just gone away. And it also uses it for scheduling because you can define things like, I'd like to have three Drupal machines or three Drupal containers, and um, if one of these three containers goes down, container will automatically take care and make sure um, that a, another container is spun up. It supports stateful applications, which means applications that store file data locally. These containers aren't as easy to relocate on other machines as a stateless container, and uh, container, um, container does support that. It has a real-time logging and statistics engine built in, and it allows to view an audit trail so you can see at any time who did what to the infrastructure at what time. That brings us to the topic of security. All um, container-managed containers are located in virtual networks that have their own IP address space and their, uh, all the traffic between the containers is encrypted automatically. Um, <coughs> in order to access these containers directly, um, Container allows you to connect via uh, common VPN software where you can um, access the encrypted network and, for example, push images to the um, local private registry that's in the encrypted network as well. This image shows the platforms that are support, supported by Container, um, you can run Container using Amazon Web Services. Um, I'm using it here with DigitalOcean. You can run it on your own on-premise um, infrastructure, for example, on Red Hat, uh, Linux, or Ubuntu. Um, so Container is really uh, very flexible in terms of infrastructure, and it allows you to even um, build hybrid 
infrastructures that run in part, for example, on AWS and in part on-premise. Before we get into the practical stuff, just a few words about myself. My name is Jochen Lillich. I'm Chief Everything Officer at Freisteel IT. Um, Freisteel is the, the German word for freestyle and is pronounced exactly the other way around. Um, I've been told that there are uh, people in, in the USA that like to fry everything. I don't know um, why you wanted to fry steel, but uh, that's exactly how our company name is pronounced. Um, on Twitter, I'm GViz, and uh, you can find my email here. So if you have any questions about this talk or everything else, um, simply give me a shout and I'll be happy to uh, respond. Our main product is Frysteel Box, which is a managed hosting platform specialized in running business-critical Drupal and WordPress websites. We started in 2010 with uh, a 100% specialization for Drupal, and in 2013 we added WordPress support as well. We limit ourselves to these two uh, content management systems because um, what we do is we implement a DevOps workflow with our customers. So other than with uh, uh, common hosting providers, you have direct access to our engineers and they complement the development teams of our agency customers um, during the whole application lifecycle. You can, of course, simply uh, get a Frysteelbox plan and, and, and run everything yourself, but the, the magic is um, having a basically a no-ops scenario for our customers where we take care of everything that needs to be done on the infrastructure side and developers can take care of the application. One can't go without the other though. Um, just this morning we had um, uh, uh, a conference call with a customer who had trouble using their database and um, we did an analysis of all the database queries and found that in 24 hours um, their database uh, uh, queried, uh, their, their application queried uh, billions and billions of database rows and we uh, worked out with the customer why that was and what to change in their Drupal application. So um, our database got to uh, work much faster again and their application as well. So um, we have the necessary know-how on, on the uh, Drupal and uh, WordPress internals that we can help our customers and really make a 100% uh, complete DevOps cycle. Back to using container. The basic container setup is very simple. There's a single container server that does all the management, and then you have the container nodes, each running the container agent that communicates with the container server and execute what uh, the server tells them to do. So the server controls the whole platform. You get access to the server uh, via OAuth. You can either use the OAuth provider that Container runs on Container.io, Cloud.Container.io to be pre precise. And um, you can also use your own OAuth provider if you so want. Creating a container server is easy. You simply install the container CLI Ruby gem, which provides you with the command line client, and then you execute a command like this. Here I'm using the DigitalOcean plugin to spin up 
uh, droplets on DigitalOcean. And I basically tell Container to start a droplet, deploy the Container server, and name it Container DCL, use my DigitalOcean token that I've stored in an environment variable, use the region London 1, my SSH key, the droplet will have uh, the size of one gigabyte, and I can use the container cloud for authentication. So let's see if my sacrifice did work out. <laughs> Looks like I'm still connected. So this will take a minute. Um, it'll first spin up the droplet and then deploy all the software that's, that's necessary to run the container server, uh, which is quite a simple thing. The container server application is uh, written in Ruby and consists of the web application on one side and a MongoDB instance as its backend and uh, that also makes it quite easy to run a high availability uh, infrastructure by simply using the common techniques to uh, get redundancy for a web application and get redundancy on the MongoDB side. Come on, DigitalOcean. No, as, as, as long as the thing is spinning, it's not the Wi-Fi. I've, I'm, uh, uh, I've connected via mobile data, uh, so I'm not dependent on the Wi-Fi. Is there an initial setup to get to the point where you're at to be able to execute this? Two commands, to be honest. Um, first of all, um, uh, install the CLI. So it's simply gem install container dash CLI. And I had to set the DigitalOcean token um, in the environment variable, and that was it. Um, and I've put the, the demo um, script on GitHub, so you can take a look at it later. So now we have our master server. Um, and as you see, it's created the droplet, then it installed the software and uh, also um, created a grid. Grids are separate groups of container nodes, of host machines, and each grid has its own encrypted, oops, sorry, um, encrypted overlay network. So actually each container grid uses the 10.81 IP address space, I think, if I recall that correctly. Um, but since everything is contained in this virtual network, uh, they don't get uh, in conflict with, with each other. So you can run as many grids as you like, and each grid is basically its own self-contained universe. And you can, if you like, connect to each grid um, via VPN. Um, the container CLI has a VPN subcommand that uh, spits out an open VPN configuration that you can use right off, out of the box. So if you don't want to use the test grid that has been created automatically, you can use the container grid command to create your own and to tell container that all subsequent commands are, um, will be associated with this grid. 
And I also can tell container what the initial size of the grid will be, in, in, uh, and a size of two is the minimum required size, because a container uses a quorum-based database for both service discovery, where all services that come up get registered and can be queried, uh, and for the key value store. And in order to have always a quorum, you need to have at least three nodes. Um, and in that case, if you start with two nodes, you'll have two nodes and the container server itself, and that gives you the minimum uh, of three uh, nodes in the quorum. Come again? The question was, is etcd run on the master as well? Um, it is, yeah. That's just the name of the grid. That's arbitrary. So let's see. So that runs pretty fast. I simply spin up another grid called demo grid and with uh, container grid use, I've told the CLI here to use that grid from here on. Let's get to the nodes. All these nodes are discovered automatically as soon as you spin up a new node, a new container agent. Um, it'll automatically connect to the container server and it will keep this uh, network connection up so um, container doesn't require open firewall ports on each node. Uh, all the nodes simply need to be able to uh, connect to the container server um, and the API that runs on it. It's easy to create nodes as well. There's another command, container node create. In this case, I'm using DigitalOcean again with my token and uh, the essential details that I need to use. Let's see how that works out. In this case, I'm spinning up two nodes, one after each other. I, I, I've uh, created a, a DrupalCon page on, on the freistillbox.com website where um, you'll find a link to my session page on, uh, for DrupalCon um, where you also um, can download the slides and uh, have a link to GitHub where I've published the demo script that I'm using here just to avoid typing errors. Of course, uh, the token that's displayed here isn't my real DigitalOcean token. Um, I accidentally hard-coded hard uh, the DigitalOcean uh, token in my first uh, instance of the demo script, um, but uh, I've changed that to use the environment variable, and I've made another commit on GitHub, so uh, the token thing, of course, as everyone knows, is resolved. No need to look at, uh, at, at previous commits. <laughs> So that was node number one. Let's get node number two added to the grid and we'll be good to go.
By the way, you might have noticed that I have a very confusing accent. That's because I'm a German living in Ireland. Come on. So I'm going to just go to the next slide while that is working in the background. So we are all good to go. And the first thing that we can use now is container services. A service is basically an abstract name for a container image that runs somewhere in our infrastructure. So you can define a service in a simple YAML file and that's where its a container is very similar to Docker Compose and it simply builds on that syntax. You can define which container image you'd like to use. You can define things like volumes for file storage. You can limit resources, for example, how much uh, memory the container is supposed to use. Um, you define if the service is in some kind um, connected to another service. Um, you can define environment variables that are going to be used by the container image. Um, you can define secrets, that's something that a container adds, and um, the registration happens automatically. As soon as you start a service, it gets registered with the central database and other services can query, I'd like to connect to a service named MySQL, where do I have to ask? You also define the deployment strategy that can be one of uh, three variants. It's HA, daemon, or random. Random simply takes the container and uh, spins, it up, spins it up on a random node. Um, the high availability um, setup is where you can define, okay, I'd like uh, three instances of this container at any time. And daemon will install the container image on all nodes. That's very handy, for example, for um, infrastructure services. If you'd like, for example, to run a monitoring application on each of your nodes, you simply tell container to run it, to deploy, de deploy it with the daemon um, strategy and as soon as you spin up a new node, you'll have another instance of the monitoring service running on it. You can define affinities to other services, so you can tell, um, for example, uh, always run um, MySQL uh, uh, on the same host as, say, memcached or something like that. And in order to have high availability, you can even define a port to wait for. So if you spin up a Drupal container, for example, you can say, okay, um, starting the container isn't quite enough. Um, I expect this container also to answer, to respond on port 80, for example, and only if that's the case, I consider this container as successfully started. And you can define health checks that will be executed uh, periodi periodically and uh, for, can, for, for example, be used for load balancing. So that's an example for a stateless service. It's very similar to the run-of-the-mill docker run command. You'll simply say, okay, I'd like to use the latest image for Nginx and uh, use that as the service also called Nginx and uh, please map the port 80 of the container to port 80 of its host so I can talk to the container and uh, container will probably um, spin that up somewhere. So let's see how that works. I hope we are ready, yep, okay. So here's a list of our two nodes, just to make sure, okay. Uh, there are two nodes, both running on DigitalOcean in the London data center. And now we are creating the, the service. That um, 
didn't spin up a container, it's just the service definition. And with the following command, I'll actually deploy a container that will be spun up and can be talked to. That's that, and the CLI tells me I created this container on node one. If I want to see more details about this service, I can use the container service show nginx command, and it'll list a lot of details, for example, in the uh, lower part on which nodes uh, the service is running and what the public IP address is. So if you uh, would try to connect to 138 and so on, you'd be talking to our new Nginx instance. With the stateful option, I can spin up another container, and the only um, difference would be that once container has chosen a node for this service, it'll keep using this node. Even if I shut down the container and two days later I'll spin it up again, um, I can be sure that it will be created on the same node again because container expects the container to use uh, a file volume on this node uh, and uh, if, if the container would be spun up on another node, it would lose all its data because uh, the file data stored in volumes doesn't travel with instances. It's easy to scale up a service. So if I, for example, would like to grow from one single Nginx instances to three, I'd simply use this command. So, that's the public IP address again, and now I'm scaling Nginx up to two, and then automatically show the details. And what we are going to see is that Nginx is, will now be on two nodes and available on two public IP addresses. Let's stop that right away so we can go on to more interesting things. Things get interesting when you start connecting services. And these groups of connected services are called container stacks. There are sets of services defined in a YAML file, and this YAML file will be versioned so you can update your uh, stack definition and uh, work with different revisions of this. Um, each stack gets its own subdomain, local in the grid it's running in, um, which makes addressing parts of the stack quite easy. So let's take a look at, um, sorry, yeah. So if you have a stack defined in, say here, the container.yaml file, you can install this stack definition and name it, for example, Drupal. And let's take a closer look at that definition. The YAML file will be in the GitHub repository as well. So it starts with a preamble. Um, I've called this stack examples Drupal and uh, gave it version one. And then I start listing um, a number of variables that I'll be using um, during this file, and that's quite interesting because here I'm using the container vault 
for our secrets management. And uh, it's amazingly simple. I'm defining, in, in this case, two variables, call, one called Drupal MySQL root, and a bit below Drupal MySQL password. Both are of type string. And I can tell container where to get the value for this variable and where to store the value of the variable. In the case of from, where I get the value of the variable from, I can tell a container to use two alternatives. I would prefer getting the value of the variable from the container vault with the key Drupal MySQL root. But if it's not there, for example, because I'm just starting to show people at DrupalCon how this works, um, it'll alternatively fall back to a random string with a length of 32 characters. And regardless of where I got the value for this variable from, I'll store it in the vault under the same name. And uh, with the second variable, I'm doing exactly the same. So that makes things very easy. I simply take on, uh, say container, well, I'd like to define a variable, Drupal MySQL root. You should be able to find it in the vault under the same name. If not, simply generate a value and then make sure to store it in the vault so we can get it next time. And the services section is where we use these variables. I'm defining a service Drupal using a image. I'm using the official Drupal image in version 8.2. I define it as stateful because I'm using a number of volumes. Um, I'll expose port 80. I'll um, define a, an environment variable named MySQL user with the value Drupal. And I'm using a number of secrets. In that case, the Drupal MySQL password secret um, and store that in the environment variable MySQL password. And then a number of volumes. So uh, the uh, more important parts of my application will be exposed in single volumes. And then I'll add the other necessary part that the MySQL service with the MariaDB image. Equally stateful, a few environment variables as well. These should um, be in sync with the variables I'm using in Drupal, otherwise the two containers won't be able to talk to each other. And two secrets that are necessary to spin up the necessary databases. Let's see. Oh yeah, okay. Let's hop right to load balancing. If I'd like to run more than one Drupal container and have load balancing, there are only a few uh, minor changes I need to make to my definition. I add a new service called Drupal LB that uses the load balancer image from container and uses port 80 as well. I'll add an instances value to Drupal, uh, in that case, I'm spinning up two instances, and then I have to define a few additional environment variables that uh, tell the container to automatically connect, or other, um, the load balancer container will automatically uh, connect to my Drupal containers in that case. And that's happening because I link these two services via the links statement. These are official, um, the, these images I'm using are official Docker um, images that will be pulled from the Docker Hub. These, they are public. So let's see how that works. First of all, I'm deploying my stack definition. And since I'm using the deploy option to the install command, uh, it'll not only um, store the stack definition, it also goes right to deploying it. 
and that's why it started to deploy the load balancer. Now it's deploying the MySQL service. And now it's deploying my Drupal containers. That's a great question. I've uh, actually left that out, yeah. Um, Can you repeat it? Yep. The question is, so if I start up, oh, sorry, start up a, a few nodes, um, they get somehow added to the load balancer. And if at a later time I spin up another node, will that also be automatically added to the load balancing? And the answer is yes. Um, what this load balancer image does is, go through all containers that are linking to you, look for these, these special environment variables that tell you how to behave, and then do it. And container is using HAProxy for that, and uh, the HAProxy is actually talking to the etcd, uh, and as soon as a new node spins up linking to the load balancer, it'll get all the necessary details from etcd and add that to its load balancer configuration, um, reload the configuration, and uh, within uh, a fraction of a second, the new node will be uh, in load balancing. And if you have defined health checks, they will also be applied. So for example, if a container doesn't answer for five seconds, it'll automatically be removed from the load balancing. That's quite ingenious, and it, it's really as simple as it looks. There's nothing I have done in, in the background or is necessary. Uh, now that everything is deployed, we have a Drupal cluster of, in this case, two nodes behind a load balancer, um, and both Drupal nodes automatically uh, talking to the MySQL instance. And uh, if you like, um, here are the different services. So we see two Drupal instances, one MySQL and one, uh, uh, two Drupal LB instances even for, for I think I've uh, installed that load balancer in the daemon configuration, so it's automatically spun up on all nodes I'll ever have. Um, so I might be able to do something to make even my load balancer redundant. And if you like, connect to one of these public uh, IP addresses, which are the IP addresses of the load balancers, and you'll be talking to a Drupal 8.2. Of course, it's a newly installed Drupal. <laughs> Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, it is. The same file system on all the nodes, so I can actually spin up my Drupal containers anywhere I want, and I'll find the same files. At the moment, I'm simply deploying them as stateful, but that won't help me because uh, files written by one node won't be accessible by the other node. 
So um, that setup isn't actually um, production ready. Um, what you can do is um, uh, use a central file system, NFS or something else, a distributed file system, and then um, in, uh, import that as volumes. Um, container won't know anything. It'll simply use these paths you defined in the uh, YAML file, and you'll have to manage the shared file system yourself. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, sometime this year, Container, the company, will add um, shared file system or con uh, volume migration or something like that. Um, you can use these, these container images to, to build a replication setup with MySQL, but you'll have to do that yourself. Container doesn't provide you with anything like that. So just a quick look at SSL, because that's equally easy. You can use uh, Let's Encrypt. You simply say, okay, I'd like to register um, at Let's Encrypt um, with my email address, and I'd like to authorize to get a certificate for www.example.com. I'll get the necessary DNS uh, authentication details that I'll have to add in a DNS record, and as soon as that's propagated, I can use container certificate get, and I'll get my uh, certificate. That certificate will be automatically stored in the container vault, and then can be used with the container load balancer simply by adding these additional settings. Now the load balancer should be talking on 443, and I'm using the uh, SSL certs environment variable, which will automatically be used by the load balancer image, and I, in that case, uh, am using the value behind le certificate underscore domain name underscore bundle, that's the default name that container will store the certificate under, and I'm good to go. It is. That's why, uh, so Let's Encrypt is free. You can use that uh, out of the box without pay paying anything, and you'll get a valid certificate. Um, and uh, I don't think uh, Let's Encrypt supports wildcard. Uh, you'll have to uh, create certificates for each um, for each um, uh, distinct certificate. So the projector has given up. Looks like it. But just to summarize, container really is simple. It's inexpensive, open source and let's encrypt. Um, it's full featured, regard, uh, except uh, um, shared file system. It's production ready, uh, it's secure, it's flexible, and most of all, it's really worth a try because it doesn't cost you anything in terms of money, and within one or two hours, you'll have a feeling if container is something for you. So. Uh, if you'd like to, to uh, take another uh, look at my slides, simply go to www.frysteelbox.com slash drupalcon.html and uh, there will be links to everything.